Hi, everyone. Uh, this is part two of an interview that we started um, speaking with Lionel Friedberg about his book, Forever in My Veins. And it was just too interesting to stop at uh, the one hour mark. So we're, we're diving in, continuing to dive in. Um, his book is fascinating. If you can get your hands on it, please read it. I think it's really relevant and important. And I believe we had finished just talking or just began to look at um, you grew up in South Africa in a, a time that uh, apartheid was the way that was life in South Africa. And I know the world responded in a really strong way as um, the country continued to uh, resist changing those laws. But you draw a parallel in your book, Forever in My Veins, where you talk about, wait a minute, at the same time that that was happening and the Americans doing economic sanctions and all sorts of protests, at the same time, I'd love you to describe what was going on in the South, in the States, and also if you can bring your, um, your sharing to, to Dr. Cameron, who was the fellow who had survived one of the lynchings. But I just found that such a unbelievable parallel. If we can start there and then we'll weave it into what's happening now in both right. countries. Mm, yes, sure. Uh, well, it was about uh, probably somewhere in the mid 90s, I was given the uh, a, a, a show to do called Vigilantes. And really what the show was about was it looked at the early West in, in, in the Western part of the United States after gold had been discovered. Uh, and in, in the, the, the largest city on the West Coast was San Francisco. Uh, but law and 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 didn't exist. There was law and disorder and theft and crime all over the place, and there there was no police force. There was nobody to protect local citizens. So people would band together and get together as vigilantes to take care to basically implement local um, law enforcement. Uh, so we looked at that, and then we looked at the uh, deep south. And then we looked at other aspects of, of vigilantism in America. But when we did the section on vigilantism gone wrong in the Deep South, this is where I was absolutely appalled because I had no idea of scale of racial injustice that took place in this country round about the same time that America was wagging its fingers at South Africa saying, you better stop your racial system, you know, free for, you've got to give everybody the vote and everybody's got to be free citizens and you've got to be introduced democracy and all that. Well, the difference between South Africa and America was in South Africa, it was enshrined as law. It was never enshrined as law here in the United States, but white supremacy was alive and well, whether it took the form of the Ku Klux Klan or just marauding groups of vigilantes running around lynching blacks for the fun of it. Uh, I had no idea of the degree to which this was going on. And when we researched the section, and I met a guy, a man called Cameron, uh, who lived in Milwaukee, and he started a little museum called the Black Holocaust Museum, uh, because he was once arrested uh, for, for something that he did not do. And they were going to lynch him. They were going to kill him. They were going to hang him up from a tree and uh, set him alight, which is the modus operandi. That was the favorite uh, way of, of, of killing blacks those days. You know, in small towns throughout the deep south on a Sunday, people would be after church. They would be told there's going to be a lynching this afternoon. Meet us at the whatever, you know, down at the riverbank or meet us at whatever, you know, area of town it was. Bring your picnic baskets and bring your kids and bring a blanket. We're going to lynch a guy. And it was a spectacle for all to see. I had no idea that this even existed because it never, ever, ever, ever existed in South Africa. That kind of behavior never took place. And yes. I think you said 5,000 blacks were murdered or lynched yes. in the deep south between the uh, late 1800s and the 1930s. Correct. Yeah. Brutally. Absolutely brutally. And then parts of their body, their body parts were cut off, fingers and other appendages were cut off and sold as souvenirs, you know, yeah. uh, to people who'd come it's there. Barbaric. To, to, it, 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 it's worse than barbaric. Yeah. Uh, and of course, some of this has been depicted in movies. 
uh, and of course, one one talks about this to some to some degree or another. But the degree to which this was going on at the same time that South Africa was pointing its fingers at South Africa is like how <laughs> you know? Excuse me. Look, look what you're doing in your own backyard. How how dare you point a finger at us? Look what you're doing, and what well, you're doing and, is and infinitely worse. Well, there is no, in my opinion, there's no worse. It's all on the scale of not acceptable. It's all part of. Yes. that system that we're talking about with power over and you know Correct. comparing atrocities i don't think it's it's even remotely helpful i think it's all in that same category absolutely um was there ever any accountability or apology for those atrocities in in in, in the united states yeah, yeah. yes there, there has been of course there has been uh, but it's taken a long long time to get there and now of course there is this wonderful new museum that exists in washington dc on the mall uh, to the African American, I think and, you you said in your book that uh, James Cameron was um, attended. And he a was public. He he did. He was given an official apology. Apology. Yes, years and years and years after it happened, but his two buddies uh, who were involved in the same incident that he was, they were murdered. They were mm -hmm. murdered. I mean, you know, it was too late for apologies. But he was apologized to, and he was very gracious about it. He was a charming, decent man. And I have no idea what happened to his Black Holocaust Museum. It's probably closed down now since the, uh, the, 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 the history of the African-American opened in Washington, D.C. Uh, but my goodness, that museum in itself, you know, it had depictions and dioramas of people being hum strung up from trees and, and drowned and, you know, set alight. And, and it was just absolutely appalling. Um, so, you know, um, we in this country are by, by no means uh, free of guilt. And... Um, we must remember this fact and it's got to be taught because a lot of people still think that way. All you have to do is to look around, you know, and look at the, you know, the, whatever the, uh, some of those groups were who invaded the, the capital in January in 2021, you know, with their t-shirts, um, with all these despicable slogans on them. I mean, you know, the fact that this goes on is just beyond my understanding. Well, and yet here we are attempting because to me, you've got we've got to we can't just put our hands up and go what what I don't know, I don't know what to do. There has to be a step that all of us can take. Yeah. And I think the first one is to examine our own privilege um, and that, you know, around whether it's race, gender, sexuality, it really doesn't matter. It's that that sense of entitlement that says yeah. I'm better than you, mm. nature. Uh, another human being, an animal. Mm. Um, you know, we're right back to the what we talked about in part one, that yeah. mm. unity is equality, is inclusion of diverse factors, as opposed right. to, you know, we're not the same. Like when we see through those eyes, yes, we're in trouble. There's nowhere to go. That's where there's nowhere to go. And I think I hear in you and in you in your explorations that there's always a search for... Um, a, a need to understand. I can feel that when you write that you're trying to understand something. And I think in this arena that we're talking about, let's see if we can take one step or two toward what anyone can do that will facilitate. Maybe we'll never understand, but there are things we could be doing that would facilitate um, a deeper compassion and unity, I think. I still believe in that. I'm still an optimist. Let's yeah. put it that way. Uh, we have to be an optimist. Uh, we have to. Uh, you've got to be an optimist. There always has to be light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And, and there always has to be something better on the other side of the horizon. You really have to believe that. And as a filmmaker, that's something that you learn very, very quickly. Uh, no matter how gruesome or how bad or how dark the message may be, there always has to be light at the end of the tunnel. There always has to be hope. And you, I, I nurture this belief that one day, you know, we will live on a peaceful planet, but we are so far from that at the moment. Um, I think a lot of it here, certainly in the United States, has to do with economic reasons. The fact that there aren't enough economic opportunities for people, and I think the pandemic has uh, the 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 uh, the COVID has made it made made things worse. Uh, I think it's going to take a long time for us to get out of the hole, um, and hopefully, when we are through the worst of this, hopefully, when economic opportunities come back again, you know that people will be given their just dues. Now, I'm in Hollywood; it is now a requirement 
it's a requirement by the the motion picture academy and by the television academy that when you cast a film you will have a variety of different actors in it you will have a good racial mix it's not just white bread anymore you know you've got to have i mean the days of hattie mcdaniel being the only person to win an academy award for gone with the wind back in 1939 and then nothing until the 60s was absolutely outrageous well today that has changed considerably um and that's a good thing and of course the 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 creative talents have changed the directors and writers and the pe people behind the camera are being given opportunities that they were never given previously uh in the in the film and television industry here in the united states but they are now thank goodness for that that's all coming about but how does that filter down you know mm. into into everyday way of life and into, into the streets uh we on which you live that's a tough one and i think you know that economic uh, uh um, um opportunities may make that better but really what it comes down to is just teaching your kids values and teaching your kids respect we have to respect one another we have to it's all about being respectful of one another. We're all the same. We're no different. We may have different skin pigmentations, but so what, you know? And I take that to another level. I take that to the non-human world as well. We may have opposing thumbs, which allows us to hold a screwdriver or a, a pair of tools and make a and make a, a, a jet that flies through the sky, whereas animals don't have that, but that does not make us superior. It only makes us the dominant species. So we really need to be respectful of all life. Um, and that depends so much on home values, on the educational system, and, you know, on the grassroots level from day one. Expose, yeah. your, expose one's kids to the right things. And to me, this is a perfect segue to extraterrestrials because I've often, from childhood, I, my fantasy was I would be walking in the country, <laughs> yeah. looking up at the dark sky, star-studded sky, but far, far away from anywhere, alone, seven years old. And I would have conversations with, with the beings up there. And I'd say, take me, beam me up, take me, <laughs> yes. because I'm going to help you understand people. Yes. Now, what a ridiculous thing for a child to say, but I somehow thought I was some no. ambassador that was going to help. No, no. help. You, you were ahead of everybody else. Absolutely. You were right. <laughs> and so what, but, but here was the other thought I landed in for this kind of unity that we're talking about, this respect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got to find the commonality yeah. that weaves us all together beyond gender, beyond the color of our skin, beyond economic uh yeah. status and that yeah. is earth yes. we are human beings we are well it, let's just go there and we are earthlings and yeah. i i thought does it do we need to be attacked by extraterrestrials for us to join together and say we are we as a yeah. species i used to have that fantasy too <laughs> but you stepped into and i want i'm moving towards ufos before we get to the voyager mm. project because mm. both very fascinating to me Mm. Um, well, maybe let's go to the Voyager first, and then we'll come back to some of the things that you experienced in your, uh, in your work with UFOs. So tell us about the Voyager project and its purpose, because it's, it's fascinating. Well, Voyager was part of a wonderful series on the public broadcasting system here in the United States <clears throat> in the 80s. The series was called The Infinite Voyage. It was a science series. It looked at various branches of science. And I was very, very fortunate enough to be given, I still regard it as my favorite film of all time. Um, I was given the opportunity of making a film about the Voyager mission. They, NASA called it the Grand, the Grand Tour. The planets were lined up in such a way that if they sent a spacecraft from Earth to Jupiter, it would be able, the spacecraft would be able to take advantage of Jupiter's gravitational pull and twist it into a direction that sent it towards Saturn. And then there were two voyages. And one of the voyages, once it reached Saturn, it would reach Saturn at such a time and at such a, 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 an, an angle that the gravitational pull of Saturn would sling it outwards towards the planet, the planet Uranus. And then from Uranus, again, talk about the Grand Tour, Uranus would sling it out towards Neptune. So we got four planets in one mission. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. The other spacecraft only went to Jupiter and Saturn. Now, both of these spacecraft are still flying today, and they won't stop ever. 
everything else that we've sent into space has either been uh, crashed into a moon uh, or burnt up in the atmosphere of other planets, but not the voyages. The voyages, as far as I'm concerned, and this is, and I'm quoting Carl Sagan here, he was in the movie. <clears throat> Carl Sagan said, you know, this is mankind's most sophisticated calling card. These little, these little spaceships will never end. They'll just keep going and going and going and they'll never end. <clears throat> the next, the, the think, next time- <laughs> You said he called it a message in a bottle cast uh, into the cosmic sea, right? That's, that's exactly, that's so Sagan, isn't it? Yeah, yes, exactly, yeah. yes, yes. Billions and billions and billions, yes. <laughs> and you know, the, the uh, Voyager 2 will probably reach the next star in about 40,000 years from now. And each of these spacecraft has a little gold disc bolted to the side of what they call the bus which is the main body of the spacecraft. I have a replica of that on my wall upstairs, and it's got a diagram of the Earth and two human beings. And for an intelligent species, if they look at this diagram, they can kind of figure out that, oh, this is the area of the galaxy where the spacecraft comes from. Um, and it's got that image on it. And on this gold record are also embedded digital images of planet Earth and the sounds of planet Earth, some of our great music and also messages from children. And, the, the, and all the messages is hello from the children of planet Earth in something like a hundred different languages. And there's little instructions on that, on that diagram as well as to how to play that record, how, how to get the digital images out of it. So any, any species with any reasonable degree of intelligence, if they come across these spacecraft, will be able to figure it out. Oh, that's how you do it. We can get stuff out of here. Um, so and I, I want to know how we depicted human beings because I'm probably going to disagree. I want to <laughs> know the songs that were picked that yeah. depict the best of humanity? Well, you know, it's very interesting. I, I keep a tape of the of the recordings or, or a, a DVD of, of them, a CD in my car, and I often play it to myself. And it's, it's got everything on it. It's got, it's got rock and roll. It's got so what Beatles songs are on it. It's got some Beatles. I, I forget which number, which, which one it is. Only one, only one, only one. Uh, Chick Corea is on it. Uh, there are, there's rock and roll, but there's also Beethoven and there's Bach. And there is, uh, I do believe there's, a, there's Mozart. There are the classical ones as well. But lots and lots and lots and lots of, and this is very important, ethnic music, <clears throat> rattles and gongs, and the sound of people living in the middle of jungles and remote places, because yeah. that, that music is equally valid. It's also wonderful stuff. Right, right. And all of that is on this record. And, you know, I often play that and I think, my God, you know, what a rich panoply of sounds we have created us, we humans. Um, this is our finest expression. Music is our finest expression because it is a universal language. Right. You don't have to know the words. Right. You don't have to understand what it's saying. It's an emotional thing. It plays with your emotions. And how, <clears throat> and how much, what better art can you get than that? The one that twists your emotions without you even understanding the language that it's using. I think it's just incredible. So music is so, so absolutely critical, but it's got lots of images of oceans, of marine creatures, of birds, of mammals, of a whole variety of different species. Just the richness of the tapestry of life as we know it on earth. But no is, history or is there also? No, no, no history. Uh, th that would be a difficult subject yes. to tackle because yes. it's, it's just pictures and sounds and, you know, sights. So it's uh, our calling card. It is a calling card. It's exactly what it is. It's a calling card. And it's the most sophisticated calling card we have. And so often when I think about Voyager, uh, and one of, the, one of the engineers was either an engineer or a scientist said to me one night, you know, in about 30 years from now, and this, I made the film in 1990 during the Neptune encounter. And he said, you know, about 30 years from now, well, it's now 30 years later. He said, if you're up in the high Sierras in California and you look up in that direction, and he pointed somewhere to the sort of west, he said, just remember that there's a little spacecraft going out there and it's not going to stop. It just keeps going and going and going. It does a million miles a day, by the way. Wow. A million miles a day. And the incredible thing is this, Tosha. Just think about this. You know, when the human mind puts itself to something, think of what we're capable of doing. Here at JPL in Pasadena, right? Not too far from where I live, maybe 30 miles away from where I live at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a, an agency that operates all these deep space missions on behalf of NASA. They talk to Voyager every single day. 
a signal comes back from that spacecraft to say we're still detecting some heat, some atoms from the sun or we're not or whatever it is in mm -hmm. deep space or we're detecting star noise you know the noise of space the sounds of the sounds of the universe and it transmits this back to pasadena and everything is recorded every single day and they can still tell the the the, the dish on the spacecraft turn a little bit more to the left turn a little bit more to the right wow. It takes days before the signal gets there, but it does get there. And, you know, if we are capable of doing things like that, imagine what we really are capable of doing um, in making the world such a wonderful place with all our technology and, and all our capabilities and all our science and all our institutions, you know, and still there are wars and there are conflicts and there are disagreements and there are all these dreadful things that happen all the time. Imagine how it was if we applied ourselves to something like the Voyager mission to make things work and to mm -hmm. make them work as beautifully as that does. It's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a well, textbook it, case. It, it's beautiful. And as I listen to you talk, I go, the, the missing piece is that each person would actually have to look <laughs> inward and clean up whatever's going on inside your own system that isn't helpful. Like this is, again, back to the question, what does it mean to be human? What about the darkness of humanity? You can't pretend it's not there. You no. have to actually make peace with it mm -hmm. and and inside yourself. So it, it's not a part of your perception and behavior. Absolutely. But before we go down any other road, I'd love, is there a way that people could see this film? Because I think it's profound. I seem to recall having seen it at a festival many years ago. The film is available on YouTube, but people have to be careful because there are a number of versions of it. Okay. And there's, there's one version that's full of, uh, of, uh, of subtitles, but there is one that's clean and it's called um, Sail On, comma, Voyager, exclamation mark, Sail On Voyager, and it's on YouTube. But they have to be careful which version they watch. The film runs one hour, and so they've got to look at the time. Uh, okay. It runs, uh, I think it's 58 minutes. Um, and try Mark's and already on it, I can tell. Yeah. He's already yeah. Googling it and going, can I find this? And yeah. put it, could you put it on our page, you, Mark? You, you, you know what? I can send you the link, by the way, as a, as a, yeah. in, an e in an email. I can find it sure, for you. Yeah, that'd now. be great. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. And uh, I did actually add a link uh, to NASA about the golden plate and the music on there for anybody who's interested. Oh, mm -hmm. so interesting. Yeah. That'd be great and to include. What was the name interview. of the film again? Sail? Sail on. Voyager, yeah. sail on Voyager, sail on comma Voyager exclamation mark. Yes, um, and you know what, what was so amazing were the, the the scientists were amazing, the engineers were amazing, everybody who was involved with that mission was so extraordinary, and they all worked together so beautifully. And if we can come together to yeah. accomplish something like that, think of what we really are capable of doing. And you know, you talk about um, Tasha, you talk about cleaning out the negativity and cleaning out the dark side. There is darkness, I think, in everybody's life. Um, but that amazing symbol of yin and yang, which I believe uh, is either it's either Chinese or Hindu, summarizes it perfectly. You know, you've got those two images that they look like two teardrops next to mm -hmm. each other in, the, in that circle. Dark and light. You know, the darkness serves the light in many, many ways because in order to reach the light, we as beings who learn by experience you've got to be pushed towards the light and the darkness has that role it negativity and darkness and violence and all of those things are all elements that push us towards the light towards enlightenment mm -hmm. to get away from the darkness so darkness and all the rest of it is not without purpose the cosmos and the universe and whoever designed all this stuff knew what they were doing you know uh, we need the dark to force us to start thinking more in an enlightened way exactly. in order to enlighten our spirits and our perceptions mm -hmm. and our souls as we all go on this incredible cosmic journey. Mm -hmm. I mean, what you're discussing, because I, I don't see that you can get rid of, I think as soon as you're trying to get rid of something, it's going to stay. Yes. That, that's literally, it will stay. So I am not making the darkness I'm not creating a judgment saying it's bad or wrong. I agree with you. It has a purpose. Right. But my approach to it, my response to it in me mm -hmm. is it, it, it has to be the same response that I have toward the light. 
Correct. In other words, I am not in a polarity of judgment. I'm just going, ah, there it is. So I'm not asleep to it. Yeah. Um, but it's a it's a relationship that's not based on good and bad. It's yes. out of the polarity yes, of I, judgment. Yes, that's, I, I hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back to UFOs, you, um, I know you had an experience in Saskatchewan in Canada yeah, where yeah, you took in, a picture. Tell us about that. In Saskatchewan of all places. So yeah. I was, I was working at that time for the National Film Board of Canada based in Montreal. And uh, we were doing a documentary on the history of housing in Canada, how urban areas develop throughout Canada. And of course, uh, as one knows, most of the major metropolitan areas in Canada are, you know, built in a, in a, in a thin line just above the north of the, the, the border of the United States. Canada is absolutely huge. And other than the shale uh, tar pits and, you know, uh, where, the, where the oil is and where the minerals are, you know, it takes a, takes a long time for towns and urban areas to develop in those areas. So the documentary was all about how do urban areas develop around agricultural activities or mining activities or whatever it was. And remember, the year is 1966. So um, we were out in Saskatchewan and what we had to do was to film at a potash plant. Now, Saskatchewan is, is absolutely flat, as one knows, you know, it's a very, very flat province. Um, and we were staying at, it was a very small crew, just three of us, and we were staying at a small motel not far from this potash plant. I would say it was probably uh, the nearest city, I don't even remember, Regina, I, anyway, it was in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, and so we had to go to this potash plant and you could see the plant from miles away from where we were staying because when you mine the stuff out of the ground and forgive my ignorance but i forget exactly what potash is and how they get it and how it was formed but it's a mineral and i think they use it in 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 uh, in uh, fertilizers and various things um as they mine it it creates white dust and this white dust goes up like a sort of column and then just sits above the mine like this in a big cloud all day long so we had our breakfast at the motel and we were driving towards this potash plant, heading towards this big white cloud on the horizon, you know, about maybe two hours away. And um, when we got to the plant itself, the guy at the main gate says, you better get down to the parking lot pretty quickly because there's something up there in that cloud. So the director said, I, I wasn't directing the film, the director said, like, what, what is it? <laughs> He said, we don't know, but there's something in that white cloud. Oh, really? <laughs> so <clears throat> we, we went down to the parking lot. The director met the manager of the mine, and they had to go inside to discuss the filming that was going to take place for the rest of the day. But I stayed, those are the days of station wagons. I stayed at the station wagon, set up the camera on a tripod, put on the longest lens that we had, something like a 300 millimeter lens, I think it was, we were shooting 16 millimeter film. So a 300 millimeter lens was, was pretty powerful uh, for that gauge of film stock. And I put that on and I trained it up on, the cl on, the, on this cloud. And a few guys who were, were working on the plant came up to me, you know, smoking cigarettes, just wanting to shoot the breeze and chat. And we were talking away. And, you know, one of them suddenly said, oh, look, there it is, there it is, there it is. And a little bit of a, of a breeze had come up and had cleared this cloud. And I saw a glint of what clearly looked like metal, um, silver. It's just a quick, you know, kickback of the sun. And I thought, oh my God, there is something up there. And I pressed the, the, the camera button and started running film. And thank goodness, the breeze came up a little stronger and revealed this object sitting up in that cloud. Now, many people have said to me, well, how big was it? How high was it? Uh, yeah. Very difficult to judge distances and very difficult to judge sizes. But I'm not exaggerating if I tell you that it was the size of, now, they didn't exist in those days. This was long before the day of the Boeing 747. But that's the size that this thing was. And it was a round disc, completely round, no windows, no method of propulsion visible at all. Underneath it, a sort of triangular shaped object connected to the disc by, a, by a, like a, a triangle, like a tripod, just sitting there. No sound, nothing. And I thought, what? And I just ran film. I must have run about 150 feet of film. That translates to, you know, a good, quite a lot of, of, of screen time. 
but it wasn't doing anything. Anyway, I ran the film and I thought, okay, that's I've got it. And I turned off the camera and then the breeze came back, covered it up and we got on with our work that day. We got on with filming at the potash plant. But you know, we were, we were very intrigued by what we had shot. So came that night, we were back at the motel. I was the one responsible for canning up all the film and sending it to the lab in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And the way we did that those days was we went down to the local railroad station <laughs> And you gave it to the local CN uh, railroad manager or, or, or Canadian Pacific. And it was sent by rail all the way back to Montreal back in those, those days. Wow. <laughs> um, so I canned this up and I, I put it in a separate can of film, sealed it up. And I put on the label, hold for, for our return. That's all I put. I didn't write down any details about it at all, as I did with all the other stuff that we shot, mm -hmm. because we had no idea what it was. Anyway, <clears throat> so we finished uh, our, our, our job and we eventually ended up back in Montreal and came the day to look at the dailies, look at the mm -hmm. rushes of what we'd shot. And we sat in the theater for hours and hours and hours looking at pretty dull, boring stuff of, you know, uh, uh, cornfields and small towns and railroad tracks and whatever else. And at the end of all of this, uh, the head of the camera department was there, the director was there, and a few other people were there who were involved in the, in the subject of the film. Uh, I forget what agency it was that commissioned the film. It was a government agency. And uh, as we had finished all of this, you know, we were all relieved. And at the back, suddenly the projectionist yells out, do you want me to run this thing that says hold for, for our return? And <laughs> I said, yeah, put it on. So he laced that up onto the projector and ran it on the screen. And, you know, we were all knocked out of our socks because there it was exactly as I had seen it. This big, huge, round disc Obviously, it, it was thicker in the middle as, than it was, and it tapered down to a thin uh, edge, and this tripod-like shape just sitting there, doing nothing. And the head of the camera department, who was a man by the name of Dennis Gilson, he said, I wonder what the Dickens that is. You know, we should send that down to the United States Air Force. They have a research division called Project Blue Book at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in, in Ohio. Maybe they can make some sense of this. Now, I have to tell you this. The kind of film stock we were using, you could use two different kinds of film stock back in those, back in those days. One was negative film, where you shoot negative film, and then you make a positive print from that. So the negative remains your master, and you keep that in the lab. You don't ever mm -hmm. use that. You make a, a positive print from that. Or you used a, a kind of film that we used to call reversal. The same film that you use in the camera is what you can actually run in the projector because it, it came out with a positive image. And that's what people often used to use in the days when they used to take slides. You know, you go to Disneyland mm -hmm. and you take slides, you take a picture, you know, you take slides. You used to shoot on reversal film. So what, what you use in your camera is what you, 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 you look at at home. Um, so we, we, we shot this on reversal film and that was our undoing. Why? Because we didn't make a copy of the film. So uh, the film was uh, uh, packed up and sent by some courier. I forget who it was. I have no idea. It was long before the days of FedEx and UPS and all of those. We sent it to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And um, then I worked on another film. And one day I was, went back to the camera department. Um, and on my way uh, in, I said to the, the woman who worked there, uh, who was the sec secretary of the, of the head of the, of the department, I said, Frankie, her name was Frankie Johnson. I said, Frankie, did we ever hear back from those guys in the States about you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that footage that we sent them? She said, oh, no, 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 uh, let me, I, we never heard back. I'll find out and I'll let you know. So a day later, she calls me into the office and she said, I called them up they denied receiving it now we know it was signed for because it went by courier we know that they had it we know that they got it and they said to her they basically said what film oh wow yeah um so um does this play into the theory that there is a cover-up yes i believe it does and you know I go to an I go to an annual event. I haven't been this year, and I didn't go last year because of the of the pandemic. But there's a wonderful event that takes place in Palm, Palm Springs every year called Contact in the Desert, where you have people coming from all walks of life to discuss 
rewriting human history are the are there aliens if so where are they who are they where do they come from and on and on and on and all kinds of stuff and about shamans and whatever else it's a wonderful event it takes five days you know and it's just a way to shoot the breeze with with a lot of really interesting people most of them are there there out of curiosity but there's some really good people there as well and that's where i met erich von daniken who was the guy who wrote chariot of the gods back in 1968 mm -hmm. which brought to the public's um, awareness the fact that maybe um, beings from other worlds have been visiting this planet, you know, by looking at ancient stone ruins and, and monuments. And I met him, an interesting guy, plus a lot of others uh, go to contact in the desert. Anyway, um, so there is absolutely no question in my mind whatsoever that we have been visited many, many times. Now, I know Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock is a is a best-selling author around the world who talks about ancient ruins and how they were constructed and some of the images that are depicted on these ruins but i but i don't even have to go to people like that i don't have to go to these so-called authorities if you look at or, or or meet people like the sun bushmen who live in the kalahari desert in botswana back in africa they talk about the people who come from the other world they do a trance dance around the fire, the men. They are nomadic people. They don't stay in one place for longer than two or three mm -hmm. days, and then they move along. The women play the drums. The men are, are the hunters. They're hunter-gatherers, and at night they have this dance around the fire, and they go into another realm. They really go into another level of, of consciousness. And uh, the reason why they do that is in order to almost do re remote viewing as to where the wildlife will be in two days' time. Where will the hunt be successful? That's why they do this. And I, through an interpreter, you know, once uh, found out that they talk about these these beings that come from this other world, as though it's, well, it's you know, it's uh, don't worry about that. That's the number twelve bus comes by every day. You know, to them, it's just a regular thing. Nothing to be, be <laughs> nothing to be alarmed about. They accept it as that's it. It happens, no question. You know, and and you. I have, I have no, I've asked shamans in, in, in yeah. Brazil, in Brazil, in, in the, I've asked shamans in, in Ecuador and so on. And certainly here in North America, you know, do you believe in, 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 in aliens? Are there beings on other worlds? Of course, without any hesitation. Of course yes. there are. Yes. Of and course can are. you share Gordon um, Cooper, the Mercury astronaut chasing <laughs> a UFO? That's kind of cool. I'm amazed at your memory. You really recall these things. Absolutely. So I did a show called Ancient Encounters for the History Channel. Uh, it was hosted by Leonard Nimoy um, in the 90s. And what this show was about was have have any UFOs been documented in the past? And we went right back to ancient Egyptian times. And on certain ancient Egyptian uh, tomb walls, are objects that look exactly like UFOs are often depicted by people who have, who have seen them uh, and even people who claim to have been abducted by the, the occupants of these craft. So <clears throat> the, the show has a, had a lot of material that we could use. And I wanted to ask Gordon Cooper about his experience because he came out one day and I forget where it was, but he said, I have seen UFOs and they do exist. I tracked him down. He was retired. He was no longer. A, he was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts. And when he was a pilot with the United States Air Force based in Germany, it was in the early 60s, he told me, I went to see him in his office, and he said, sure, of course, they're, they're, they're here. They've been here forever. And he said, you know, I was, we were based uh, at Rammstein in Germany, and one day we got a scramble signal. And we had to take off, and we had to go and investigate an object that was flying, I don't know, something like 50,000 feet above the ground, which is very, 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 very high. And uh, the Sabre jet, the F-86s, could reach that altitude with difficulty, but they could. And he said, we, we came across the circular object. Well, it defied everything we knew about flight. It defied the physics that we knew. It came to a standing a standstill, and then it would shoot off at thousands of miles an hour. We couldn't keep pace with it. We tried to take photographs of it, nothing doing. This thing was just absolutely amazing. It was not of this earth, that I know. And, uh, he, and he told me, he said, you know, we as, uh, when we were belonged to NASA, we were sworn to secrecy, that if ever we did come across anything like this, don't talk to the press. 
and don't talk to the public. This is not for common knowledge. They were instructed to not talk about this stuff. Well, you know, there have been many, many examples of that because I also spent a day once with Neil Armstrong, who, as we all know, was the first man on the moon. And he was doing a show on the history of flight. And they were filming at Mojave Airport here in California. And uh, during the lunch break, I said to him, Colonel, do you mind if I have lunch with you? You know, and the, the truck came along and, uh, with the sandwiches and whatever else. And it was as hot as Hades. And I said, let's go and sit in the camera truck in, in the cab. And we did. And, uh, and, and, and uh, he had his plate of food and I had mine. And I said to him, Colonel, and, and I knew I was taking a risk by asking him this because he, he, he was a very, very private individual. And I was warned about this. But I said to him, can I ask you a personal question? And he sort of looked at me askance like this as though, oh, no, here it comes again, you know. <laughs> he said, what? And I said, the rumors that you and Buzz Aldrin had seen something on the surface of the moon, is there any truth to that at all? And then I sort of shut up, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he said to me, you didn't ask me that, and I'm not going to answer it. And he just kept on eating his lunch. What does that tell you? <laughs> you <know? Wow. laughs> well, it, it, it tells me that, you know, if it was an absolute negative or a no, it would be like, no, what are you, that, that's just crazy talk. It's, you know, that, like some sort of a defense of it is what I would exactly to say. Exactly. And, yeah. Wow. No, Powerful. no, no. You didn't ask me that and I'm not answering it. Yeah. And this, you know, what we're talking about so weaves together. I know it's not obvious at the beginning, perhaps, if you named all these different topics that we've, you know, put our toes into. Mm. But I'm about to move into near-death experiences. It, yeah. it, it all still stems back and weaves back to our interconnectedness, right. to who are we as humans? Why yes. are we here? What is the, what is this universe what is the mystery? Because it is a mystery, so much mystery. Yeah. And you've been shown and had personal experiences of so many different things. Mm -hmm. um, and in your book, of course, weaving it together with the fact that many of them were predicted yeah. uh, by shamans in Africa. That in yes. itself, yeah. you know, is amazing. But let's let's move into Beyond Death, the documentary you did about near-death experiences and exploring mm. that whole realm. Yeah, right. Um this was a show called Beyond Death. And by the way, that's also available on YouTube, Beyond Death. And again, be careful which one you uh, choose because there are versions of it. The, the show runs just under two hours, but it's on, it's on YouTube. And uh, the, the brief was, what happens to consciousness after the demise of the physical body? Where does it go? Is there any scientific proof that consciousness can exist outside of the physical body. And if so, when the physical body dies, what happens to that consciousness? That was the brief. Don't give us any ooga booga haunted houses, things that go bump in the night. We want science, you know? <laughs> so we tried to give them science. I forget the, 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 the cable channel that it was for. It might've been for A&E, but I, I can't recall. Anyway, it's, it, it'll be, uh, it's on that documentary. And, um, and I met a number of individuals uh, who all claim to have had near-death experiences, who all claim to have died, but had lived through that experience and were resuscitated back again, and who remembered what happened to them when they were clinically dead. One of the most astounding stories was uh, a woman who had uh, a, an aneurysm of the brain, and I, I interviewed her, and I interviewed uh, her surgeon in Atlanta. And... Um, she they had to they had to stop her heart because they had to stop the blood from flowing in order to open the skull in order to access the aneurysm and cut it out otherwise she would have bled to death when they removed the aneurysm and then quickly sew her up again put the skull back in one place and you know get going now there's a limited amount of time that the brain can do without oxygen before it, mm -hmm. it it's permanently damaged but for for however the longest period of time that 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 the human brain can uh, uh, survive um, th this is how long she was, she was basically um, clinically dead. Um, and then when she, when she re was revived from the surgery, uh, the surgeon said, you know, to her, are you feeling? She said, oh, absolutely fine, except I was, I was really cold when I came back again. And he said, what do you mean you were very cold when you came back? And he, she said to him, well, you know, I, I, I saw everything you did 
um, and when I came back into my body, it was very, very cold. And he said, came back into your body, like, what do you mean? And she said, well, while you were operating on me, I floated out of my body and I was looking down in the operating room, looking down at what you were doing. He, of course, he didn't believe a word of it, the surgeon. And he started asking her questions over a period of days, of course, not right away, uh, as she regained her strength. And she came out with the most extraordinary thing. She said, you don't believe me, do you? And he said, well, it's hard for me to believe that. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, what about the time when the nurse, you asked the nurse for a certain instrument and she passed it to you and she dropped it and you scolded her. Why did you do that? That wasn't her fault. He said, you saw that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, I saw that. Why, why, why did you pay her? You know, it wasn't her fault. <laughs> Not only that. He, because the surgery was so long, he had a little tape deck playing in the corner of the operating room. You know, it took about four hours, this whole procedure. And she said to him afterwards, she said, you know, I don't like all your music. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? She said, well, this group and that group and that one, I like that one, but I didn't like this. He said, how do you know? She said, I was listening to it. I was up floating in this, on the ceiling and I was listening to your music. Well, you know, he said to me that he had no doubt whatsoever that what this woman was telling was the truth. Now, here's the interesting thing. I interviewed a number of adults who were clinically dead and described to me what had happened to them. But the most extraordinary thing were the children. Because I was introduced to a pediatrician up in uh, Seattle who had done work with young children the age of about five, six, seven years of age who were all clinically dead and were resuscitated. They were brought back to life again. And they weren't all his patients, but he kept a file about all of them because the other surgeons who had worked with these kids knew that he was doing research on them. And he kept a file about all of these kids. And I was allowed to, to interview three of them. And <clears throat> he said to me, you know, the most extraordinary thing is all of these children had similar dreams. And I asked them to draw what they called was their dream when they were asleep and look at this he opens up the book and he shows me these pictures and without exception all of these kids drew a tunnel a long tunnel and they said they went down this tunnel some of them said at the other end of the tunnel was jesus some of them said at the other end of the tunnel was a doctor in a white coat some of them said there were angels at the end of the tunnel in white coats and they invited me into this big room and then they were given the option to either stay in this big room with them or come back to mommy and daddy. They were given that option. And all of these kids who were resuscitated, they said, well, we decided, all right, we'll, co we'll go back to mommy and daddy. So one child said they were given a green or a red button to press. And if I pressed the green button, I would go back to mommy and daddy. Another child said I would, there was a lever. And if I pulled this lever, I would go back. Another child said I was given, there was a door. If I went through that door, I would go back to mommy and daddy. If I went through that door, I could stay here where I was. So there was this option that they were given. They were all given the choice of returning back to the land of the living. And their images were so similar. These are kids. They don't make this up. And none of these kids knew each other. Yeah. So yeah. you're convinced, like, what did it do for you in terms of making this documentary? What did Well, you know, I, I've, had, I've had my own experience about this when my father passed away. My father uh, was, a, was, was an absolute skeptic. And um, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer when he was 63 years old. And uh, he was living in Zambia at the time. And I had to bring him down to South Africa for medical treatment. And he was diagnosed. They, they told me he'd probably got six months to live. And um, one day I said to him, Dad, let's, let's go and take a walk. And I'm an only child. So I was very close to my, both my parents. And I went walking with my father and I said, Dad, you know, you are going to die from this because there's no way they can heal you. Yeah, I know about that. Yes, I'm fine. I'm fine with it. You know, he was fine. And even then he was still smoking his cigars and his cigarettes. You know, he said, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die. That's the end of the story. It doesn't matter, you know. And I said, I want you to do me a favor. And this may sound very strange to you, but don't laugh at me. I said, when you do die, if you can, would you make contact with me? And he said, yeah, 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 you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll do that and forgot about it. So comes the day where I get a telephone call, come to the hospital now. Your father is in the process of transitioning and he was dying. My mother was there. Um, my first wife at the time was also there. The nurses were there and I went to him and he 
the, the cancer had got to his brain and uh, I, I held his hand when he passed away. And um, this was about 11 or 12 o'clock in the morning uh, that, that, that day. And that night I was in bed. Um, I couldn't sleep, but my, my father-in-law, who was a doctor, had given me something to help me sleep that night because um, it was a pretty traumatic experience nevertheless. And, um, and somewhere in the middle of the night I woke up and I heard what was an echoing footsteps. And I, I sat up straight in bed and at the foot of the bed, there was my father looking as young, younger than he'd ever looked in his life, healthier than he'd ever looked in his wife. And he came around, around the bed and he stood over me like this and he just looked down at me. He said nothing. All he did was he looked at me and he smiled and he nodded his head as if to say, you were right. There is more. He turned around and left the room. My wife suddenly woke up and she said, who was that? Who was that? Who was here? So I said, what do you mean? She said, I heard footsteps. Who was in the room? <laughs> uh, you know, death is not the end of it at all. And uh, I am an absolute and fervent. I don't like to use the word belief because belief sounds like throwing faith at something without, mm -hmm. any, without any proof. But I know that reincarnation is a fact of life. We all go through many lifetimes, right. all of us. Whether we're a pony or a person or a petunia, we keep going round and round and round, and we're all on a cosmic journey. We're all evolving all the time. For what purpose? Who knows? To where? Who knows? But that's not the point. Mm. The point is it's happening. And the point is that we are on this journey. And the point is that the cosmos is even stranger than our wildest imaginations can ever imagine it to be. And that's what's important. Yeah. So tell our listeners, I know we've got to start to wrap things up here, where can they I can speak, get before your Before we go there, I just, I just want to comment on your last story, Lionel, because as you tell the story of your father, that was a very similar experience my grandmother had when my grandfather passed away. Yes. Um, you know, it was, a, it was a ringing of a phone. She got up in the middle of the night and he came through the, the back door. And yes. like you say, he was an, young, in the best shape, best looking, like in, in that exactly how you described. I get chills thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. You know, it was as, as real as though he was in the flesh. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it was that real. Um, and many people have told me similar stories. Mm -hmm. Many, many people. I don't doubt it for one moment. And you know, when, when, kids, when kids say, oh, mommy, look, there's grandma sitting over there in the corner. And what mommy says is, you've never met your grandma. Grandma died before you were born. What are you talking about? That you're, that's your imagination. They shouldn't do that. They should say, oh, why don't you ask grandma how she's doing? Yeah. Ask, ask her how she's feeling or describe her to me. But don't make the child deny it because that's how we take this away. We, we all have this capacity, this capability. But our, our, our culture denies it to us. Mm -hmm. Our culture limits us so much mm -hmm. into yeah. little boxes as opposed to everything we've been talking about is the reverse. It's an opening of interconnected, you know, on the grid, whether it's our ancestors or each other or, you know, energy is connected. It isn't se separated and labeled. As, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, even, the, even the scientists will tell you this. You can destroy anything except energy. That that goes on. It does. You can't destroy yeah. energy. It continues, yeah. in another form. Right. So, where can our listeners get your book? So, again, it's called "Forever in My Veins: The How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman." Where can yeah. they get it? Uh, it's available if your bookstore is open. Under these pandemic conditions, it may not be, but it should be in your local bookstore. Otherwise, it'll be available online from Amazon.com. Uh, Amazon.com US, Amazon.com Canada. Uh, it's available on Barnes and Noble website. Um, it's available throughout the English speaking world. Um, so it's available online uh, or at your local bookstore. And what's next for you? Do you have any projects coming up? Well, or anything the, you want to share? The next one is, 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 is a history of aviation in Africa. I'm totally fascinated by aviation. I love techie stuff, I love engineering, and I love the, uh, the challenge you know, of doing really hard things. 
So I wrote this book about, about aviation in Africa. It's called The Flying Springbok, and that'll be available uh, in July. Awesome. It has been such a pleasure getting to know you a little bit. Um, I want to leave when it, this is being played on the radio. I'm really big on music and, and want to leave everyone with Peter Gabriel's song called Biko, which pays homage to a South African anti-apartheid mm, activist, wonderful, Stephen wonderful. Bantu Biko, who died in 1977 while in police detention. Yes. And, and I think because we have two shows, I'm also going to, I know there was a lot of controversy around Paul Simon going to South Africa mm. um, during apartheid. But he also, I'm on the sort of on the other side going, he also opened internationally the world to the beauty of black um, tribal, you know, uh, music. And, and I think he did so much. I think that tour did so much, even though there were many protests and a lot of people not on that side. Let me um, just say one thing about Paul Simon. Mm. When, when Paul Simon first went to Africa to do his big concert there with Lady Smith, Black Mombazo and, yeah. and all of that and, and, and playing, you know, the shoes yeah. are studded with diamonds and all those wonderful songs. Mm -hmm. That was in Zimbabwe, not South Africa. He would not go to South Africa. Ah, okay. He went to South Africa. That. He went to South Africa later, but his first concerts were all, all took place in Zimbabwe. Right. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to feature music from uh, from all of that and that whole era, and kind That's of wrap it wrap it around our words and and your sharings, which have just been so important. I think. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank, thank you, you, Tasha. Thank you, Tasha, and thank you, Mark. It's been an absolute guest. I've loved it. Thank you so much for having me. And again, you can uh, listen to this interview. Well, hopefully you're listening on the radio, 100.5 FM, Conscious Living Radio, Co-op Radio in Vancouver. Also available on the YouTube channel, also at www.consciouslivingradio.org. Thanks for joining.